research for 35 years and is now the lead analyst at Faultline, a digital media research service offered by Rethink Technology Research. In his work at Faultline, Peter has built an understanding of wired and wireless triple play and quad play models, including multi screens, video delivery, taking in all aspects of delivering video files, including IPTV. His work includes all the various content protection, conditional access and digital rights management, etc. What's important today is uh, in the context of mobile operators facing continuing CapEx calls over the next 12 years using 3GPP endorsed strategies, whose calls for CapEx will go on relenting and investors are, will punish the operators that go down the route with a lower share price. The picture looks very bad for mobile operators and Peter will today explain some of the important trends that are affecting uh, the cellular operators and some ways around that inevitable uh, decline. Uh, before we start, I would like to go through uh, some housekeeping items here. And uh, you have in front of you the webinar interface where you can see a number of options including the grab tab that you can click to open and close the control panel. Uh, there is also an audio pane here if you have experiencing any problems with the audio setup you still have choice to call back using the telephone number. Uh, you can submit questions uh, and we encourage you to do that during the webinar and we'll review the questions at the end of Peter's presentation. Uh, some commonly asked questions include um, the slide deck which will be provided to you in the next 24 hours. This event is being recorded so we'll also send you a link to the video replay. And if you have any additional questions about the research presented today uh, please uh, reach out to our website indicated here or to my personal contact information which I will provide towards the end of the webinar. And so now without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome Peter White to present his uh, views on the video of loading. Peter? Good morning everybody in the uh uh, in America, if you're coming from Europe and uh, uh, further east, then good afternoon. Um, we know, or at least we think we know, that uh, video web traffic <coughs> is growing exponentially and mobile traffic uh, as well. Um, if we believe the reports like the Cisco Visual Networking Index and uh, the Ericsson Mobility Report, data grew about 100%, a mobile data grew about 100% last year. Inside that video, it's expected to continue to grow 100% for a few more years until it becomes about 60% of all mobile data. Um, what I study is the disruptive um, power of video, and one of the things I'm going to say to you is that it's going to be a lot worse than that. Um, I think video will make up far more of, of uh, mobile data than that, and I think this is because there are a number of um, events that will happen that um, which can't be taken in in linear forecasts at the moment because a lot of services haven't yet started or taken off. Um, before I do that, I'm just going to um, mention a few words about my service. We call it Faultline. There's a line running through the uh, logo which um, um, points out uh, a single disruptive point in, in the top case where the Sony Walkman gave way to the Apple iPod, um, that was the um, disruption caused by music going from analog to video, and that was very much what I wrote about during the first 10 years of uh, the Faultline service. Um, as I say, we argue that linear forecasting, which is the process undertaken by almost everybody in this market, um, is ren rendered null and void once you get um, a sudden new surge of activity from a new quarter, a sudden new disruptive element. Um, so what we try to do here in this um, in this um, presentation and in the report that uh, 
I wrote that led to this presentation is try and show a picture of what life's going to be after multiple waves of um, disruption. So, Trends. Uh, um, um, Peter, perhaps before we dive into those trends, I'd just like to push the first poll and understand uh, a little bit the audience here, where they're coming from. So if you could uh, just take a couple of a few seconds to answer you know, which part of the ecosystem you, you belong to, uh, it would be helpful for uh, you know, understanding you know, where, where your interest uh, in this topic lies in. So we still have a few uh, uh, responses coming in. Uh, and we'll be closing the poll and uh, sharing the results. So let's see here. So I'm now closing the poll and sharing the results. So we have a majority of uh, software and hardware vendors, uh, not surprisingly, followed by uh, service providers. Well, we don't have any OTT or content producers today. And others uh, as uh, uh, another important category. So I wonder whether those are analysts, press, media, or consultants. So thank you for responding to the poll. And uh, back to you, uh, Peter. OK, so I'm just going to go over each of these six trends very briefly, just to provide some evidence that they are actually going on, and then try and sum up by thinking about where that leads us. Um, so just going to the first trend, um, the idea that brought cast free to air television will go over the internet. Um, now obviously in America most people kind of shrug at this because less than 20% um, of homes receive broadcast free to air over the radio waves but around the west, rest of the world it's, um, it's um, quite, a, quite a, a large number with about 50% of homes absolutely relying on broadcast free to air as their main television. And in America it's going through quite a radical step with um, the with Aereo, who's basically taking it um, over the internet without to multiple device types, but without uh, necessarily paying a retransmission fee. Um, if you look at an assumption, Aereo may grow to Netflix proportions, um, and that would mean it would reach three, 30 million American homes in the next five years. Its own CEO says that it expects to reach 78.5 million individuals in that time frame. Um, then you get a, an idea of this is not factored in. This is not factored in into the uh, into the data calculations that we're making uh, prior uh, to this point. So a mobile stream in area at the moment is is quite quite thin. It's only 550 kilobits per second. But if that did go to 78.5 million individuals. Um, on a regular basis. It could be 700 petabytes of extra data, much of it going through cellular, and that's just in the US. And that's in a market where most television goes over wires already. Um, globally, it can have a much more um, a virulent effect, and that virtually doubles US mobile data traffic on its own. Um, Netflix already is 30% plus of US internet traffic when it's sent at prime time. Uh, typical usage is between one and two hours a day. At the moment, we've reached the point where 11% of this is already on a, a, a mobile device like a smartphone, and 5% on a tablet. That regularly rises every time uh, that number is looked at. Um, so currently, mobile traffic is just a few percent of global fixed line traffic. A fixed line traffic is around 44 exabytes a part. Second trend I want to look at is um, that 75% of all pay and free TV viewing will shift from TVs to tablets. I get a lot of um, I get a lot of pushback on this when people say, "Oh, that's definitely not going to happen. The main screen is going to continue to be a central central focus in the home forever." And then I say, "Well, do you have a tablet?" And they, so they say yes. And does your wife have a tablet? Yes. And does your child have a tablet? Yes. Do you watch video on it? Yes. Um, so for the top moment that people are watching video on it, that's already 75%, even if the, the main screen is still on. But we just see lots of trends here um, from the Uyalo Global Video Index. Uyalo is a, a provider um, in this space. Um, viewing on tablets has already doubled since the last quarter of 2012. So video. Uh, time spent from quarter four to quarter one, that transition was doubled. That doubled. Um, um, from 
this time last year, um, they watched five times longer on tablets, four times longer on smartphones. So um, we're looking at um, tablet audience spending 50% of their viewing time watching long premium content, long form content. Um, so, that, and, and this is this is going up all the time. Shall we go ahead and um, uh, push the second poll here, uh, which is uh, about trend number one, but okay. uh, still uh, relevant here. So let's see here. There you go. Launch the poll. But the second part here is: Do you believe that video usage on cellular will be, you know, much more, a bit more, less, far less? Don't know. Um, suspect uh, uh, well, most of the answers will uh, concentrate in one response here. So we would like to leave a few more seconds for people to uh, to vote. Uh, I'll be closing the poll in a second. And sharing the results. Uh, can you see the results, uh, Peter? Okay. So 63% uh, believe uh, video usage on cellular will be much more, whatever that, that is. And, and then 31% believe it's a bit more. Uh, we have 6% who don't know. So uh, probably the opinion uh, out there is geared towards much more video usage over cellular. Up to you. Which makes the the problem with uh, networks all the more acute. Um, we're seeing 74% of consumers looking at 30% um, of video a day. Um, if, you, if you take a home with three portable devices, um, that, that amount of traffic would mean that, that, that viewing on portable devices is already 10% of online viewing. Um, so as, as soon as all of America or all of the world catches up and has that number of devices, that, that type of growth is built into a linear forecast. Um, hours spent watching streaming video on tablets and mobile went up by 100% in 2012. Um, tablet viewing has jumped to 7% of online viewing from June last year, and it was 3% a year earlier. That's, um, that kind of gives way to this type of graph shape. And this is what we're, we're seeing. This is what we, um, this is what a linear projection gives you. And, and, and this is the number that we, it will be much more than this. Um, so, you know, just just more than doubling once, just more than doubling again, and just more than, uh, and then slowing down somewhat. We see tablet ownership rising. These these figures come from the Pew Research Center, one of the best sources of uh, information in the states. And it looks like they go up um, at about 13% of all U.S. adults buy a new buy their their first tablet for the first time at uh, each year. All of them use video. Now, here's another kind of hidden reason um, that's been going on in the marketplace. Um, home media gateways um, have been have been settled on by Comcast, Time Warner Cable, DirecTV, and AT&T. Since Consumer Electronics Show, they've either announced reference designs or said that they will install these devices in volume. Typically, these will roll out to about 60% of their customers over a four or five year period. Now, this does not put extra weight on cellular um, necessarily, because what's happening is that these devices have transcoding, they have extremely powerful 1200 DMIT processors um, that can manage with transcoding assistance. And they, um, um, so people are going to be watching this over, over Wi-Fi. But it, it, it educates the, um, the usage. And, and we see this coming through in subsequent usage. Um, if 50% of US homes have transcoding capability for linear channels by about 2017, this will drive this up to about 150 million portable devices um, doing a typical time per day usage of two to three hours of watching video. Um, and gradually that, that um, barrier of, of taking it on the road will evaporate. We'll, we'll come to more to that a bit later. Um, there's one that, what, that people don't really think about, and that's the, the reconstruction of the movie industry. The movie industry is going to stop uh, is going to to have a re reduced um, <clears throat> reliance on theatrical release over time as OTT release goes up. 
At the moment, we don't see any OTT movies out uh, same day as the theatrical release, and it's certainly all the arrows point to that being not only a trend, um, but certainly for OTT to release in volume um, perhaps 60 days after theatrical uh, and replace DVD revenues. We saw DVD rising from about 2002 every year until it suddenly hit a maximum in around 2004, adding $12.1 billion of revenue to, to the movie industry. Um, but by 2009, that had slid away. That, had, that was mostly um, driven by piracy uh, and some online uh, movie services. But that had slid away so that it was now, once again, less than the theatrical um, release uh, in cinemas. Um, we've seen it fall every year uh, since 2009, and it continues to fall away. And, and the question is, is it going to be um, replaced by OTT revenue? And it's, it's not really. Um, what we see is, is a different pattern. Um, certainly, theatrical admissions themselves are going down. Um, this graph would be the same for Europe, Western Europe. Uh, and America and more advanced countries that have stable numbers of cinema uh, complexes. Um, this number goes up in China, in India, and in, in Indonesia and some of the Asia pack countries. But the number of seats filled per, um, per movie has gone down every year for seven years. This doesn't mean revenue has gone down. Um, this is um, it doesn't mean revenue has gone down, but that's mostly because uh, we've compressed the exploitation cycle of movies so that instead of them going out um, in 400 US cinemas in one coast and then slowly rolling out across America, they now kick off at 3,500 cinemas in, in America and typically a month later uh, exported to Europe and Asia Pacific. And in fact, one a few weeks ago, the new the new movie Thor was launched internationally and is yet to be seen in the U.S. and that's a first. And that's because it gets more revenue because it's less susceptible to piracy. But it also um, makes um, less people want to go in the first place because they can know they can wait for the, the release. Online movies um, from companies like Netflix and, and its rivals uh, grew about 135 percent revenues this this year. But this only drives about $3 billion of consumer spend, and about $1.7 billion of that gets back to the studios. So we've got an imbalance. DVD and Blu-ray brings in $11.1 billion, but um, that only provides 43% of the viewing, but about 80% of the revenue. Um, and that's an imbalance. What the, uh, the simple economics, what the consumer is saying, it's either Netflix or piracy, DVDs are too expensive, and we're going to see this trend accelerate. Uh, the natural conclusion is movies are mostly online. Revenues are just a few billion, but a lot of that going straight to the movie studios. The cost of manufacturing disappearing, the cost of retailing disappearing, and um, the studios staying relatively healthy, but um, more strain on every type of network out there, both fixed and wireless. Um, it's a really quite a, a interesting um, story going on in movies, and this, this t helps tell that story. Um, the, um, the gray part is American uh, um, revenues for, um, for Hollywood movies, and the, um, the other part is the international. As the international market has grown, the tail has, has stopped wagging, has started wagging the dog. Um, the tastes that we see uh, that have changed in movies mean that many writers are kind of pushed out of Hollywood um, towards the TV industry and that every theme that doesn't have an international flavor, that doesn't have um, some kind of global flavor, um, it's, is limited to the US and the studios have become more and more aware of this and have, have gone uh, aggressively out to get that revenue, which is why we now see the release cycles being in sync rather than one behind the other. Um, there's a, a book um, about this um, called Sleepless 
in Hollywood, written by Linda Obst, uh, a woman who, who was the producer of the movie Sleepers in Seattle. And she goes on at great length explaining a kind of mass exodus of talent from Hollywood into TV. And the results of that has been that um, a number of key properties in television have got stronger, most of them in national broadcast television. And um, that makes a bigger gap between um, the very good on television and the very bad, with the very good driving all the social media networks and people feeling left out if they're not part of that experience. And the very bad, well, let's look at the very bad. We took some numbers from Nielsen uh, on, on what are actually zero viewership. Now, Nielsen's role in life is to promote all programming to the advertising community, so it never willingly admits to zero viewership, but it has about 35 programs listed on it that have, um, uh, when, when, when somebody looked, uh, had uh, zero. And these are just some examples, um, you know, a Mexican music program, uh, an antiques valuation show, women's professional rodeo, I'd watch that. But um, th these, if you can be sure that if Nielsen uh, admits to this many zeros, there's a lot more zeros or very low or, or, um, um, viewing figures out there. And we feel that over time, uh, it's fairly inevitable that, um, that uh, the bundles that the, uh, the, of, of channels which are forced onto pay TV operators and then forced on consumers um, can't be sustained. And we think that as things, as the market goes video on demand, there's no online revenue for the for the for these types of programs, whereas there's there's lots of online revenue for these types of programs, and uh, as a result, um, the the disparity between them in terms of revenue gets greater and greater until you close them down, you lay them off, and the individuals who have professional skills in developing video um, go. Uh, start doing projects which where, where the only market for them is over the top, and that actually drives even more over the top um, content, which drives even more network usage. And these types of numbers, um, you know, the Game of Thrones still has 14 million plus on every um, on every um, um, every uh, season. Um, we saw 24 have 9 million quite a lot more than nine million many times uh, over about nine seasons uh, and, and the other two um, similar numbers. So we come to part five that um, pay TV, TV everywhere from the pay TV community will become um, probably the, the most used uh, app in the world. Um, we talked about the media gateway before, we talked about um, how that creates a Wi-Fi delivered, transcoded environment. We know that Comcast has already negotiated all rights for out-of-home viewing, and the moment that goes out of home, it's going to go over cellular. Obviously, it could go over Wi-Fi. If, if America can get a sheen of Wi-Fi hotspots over most of the metropolitan areas, then, then some of that can go over Wi-Fi. But that's certainly going to be an out-of-home experience. We know recently that Echo Star gave up trying to sell place shifting to the cable community and pushed it off to Aris. And we know they're going to be quite aggressive in um, pushing place shifting both in the transcoding sense around the home and in the shifting over long distances to out of home experiences. Now some of this can be absorbed. You know, there, there, there's work in the security community to allow. Um, copy to a portable device and play out of home. We, there are a couple of services already enabled. They're very, the security is weak. It is a danger to, um, to Hollywood in terms of uh, it being stolen. Um, but we'll see more and more work done in that area. Okay. There are a couple of other Time, uh, Sorry, uh, Peter. Uh, I, I like Peter, to, time for a third poll. Is uh, exactly what you were talking about. Uh, do you believe the pay TV everywhere service will ever take off? Uh, I suspect uh, most people will, will will say yeah, one or the other. So 
Let's give it a few more seconds for people to vote. Seems there's a lot of uncertainty uh, among the audience. Uh, so let's close the poll here and share the results. So 55% uh, believe yes, pay TV everywhere will take off, but 30% don't know. The rest just believe that it won't. So seems like this is an emerging trend and that there's a lot of uncertainty. Are those results surprising to you, Peter? Or did you expect no, more? No, they're, yes? they're not surprising. It, there's been a lot of confusion when the, when the industry began offering uh, TV Everywhere services. The first thing it did was send it over the open internet, um, uh, although it had to go to the uh, home um, internet uh, portal. But um, now um, it's, it's, this is a major shift to, to just transcoding it. They, they were unsure. So why should the public be sure? Why should the investors be sure? Okay. But there's now a consensus there. Going through other accelerators, this, this is one that people often don't get. Um, we've got about 1.1 billion smartphones in the world, um, and they're not all capable of taking a video, taking a video service. They're either, they don't have video acceleration hardware inside them, or the screen isn't large enough or have enough pixels to do a good job, or the actual air interface that it's connected to uh, isn't fast enough, and, and the chip that drives that interface isn't fast enough and can't be upgraded. And something like um, a half of smartphones that have been deployed um, are video capable in that sense, that you could view long-form streaming content rather than just the odd YouTube clip. Um, in somewhere like America, uh, the UK, uh, China, we have 24 months cycling of, of smartphones. So typically, it only takes two years to sweep that aside, and you, you, as long as you have the networks fast enough to deliver it, you, you will have the smartphone, you can certainly handle it. In other places, Brazil, India, uh, uh, Asia Pacific, th that's not the case. Um, the average lifetime of the smartphone could be three, four years. Um, so um, what that does is that the next billion smartphones will be shipped during 2013. That billion will all be video capable. That accelerates the trend. We're coming from a much smaller base than we realized. A smaller number of phones were driving all the revenue traffic than we realized. And when you, you, you kind of take that base down, instead of it doubling, it kind of trebles because of simply on a linear calculation. Um, another part of that is, is, all, is all about who's on contract and who's on prepay and what the caps are associated with those. The caps on, on, on prepay tend to be about a quarter of what they are on um, full-blooded contract smartphones. So um, again, that, that manipulation of caps and how those caps are used to drive people from 3G to LG, LTE um, and how much more data you need to deliver uh, higher resolution video in LTE all, all kind of speaks to the equation that it's not a straightforward linear calculation and, and it's going to grow faster than that. I'm just going to flip through slide 21 and talk about what operators expect they'll do. Um, this came from um, a study that, that my, uh, my uh, partner Caroline Gabriel did um, asking operate, 65 operators uh, about their intentions and, and the, the difference between those in 2012 and 2016. And, you can see that you know, you know, the people that are thinking about small cells are going, yeah, we're going to do small cells now, and it's a slow, long process. We'll still be doing it in 2016. And that's the smaller number thinking the same kind of thing. The same with traffic management. We need to do something about you know, ma managing our traffic, whether it's video optimization or any other kind of management. But when you come to offload, immediately they say, we have to now do Wi-Fi offload. And, and a much lower number, and people think it's a temporary thing, and it is in a way. It's like a um, it's like a land grab for um, for uh, Wi-Fi capacity. Um, I just want to show this graph because this graph was shown to me by Nicholas Zenstrom in about uh, 2003, and it was his uh, before he launched as he launched Skype, just after he launched Skype, and. This was um, what fixed line operators were going through, in his opinion, were going to be going through between 2000 and 2010. And the answer to that problem, as they lost voice revenues, was to 
uh, generate more broadband. And now if you shift the dates on, this is what's happening to uh, much of the cellular community. And you don't ask for a high capex spend when one of your core revenues is doing this. And if your answer to this problem is to do broadband, wireless broadband, what that's going to do is create new competitors for these existing revenues, both voice and SMS. So we, we, we're starting to look at how you, you can see the pressure on, on, the, the, you know, on a cell code now. It, doesn't, it wants CapEx to slow down in line with his revenues. He's got to keep them it roughly as it is today. It can't suddenly go up. So we think the Wi-Fi is the only answer for now, and we think this probably extends um, for some time. Um, other moves that cell cellular operators can use, they can just stay right at the front edge of the 3 GPP curve. Um, they can implement small cells. They can move to HetNex. They can uh, install DAS. They can use MIMO in the handset. They can go early to LTE Advance. All of that is very high capex. Um, and, and so that speaks against that strategy working. Um, they can get more spectrum. Now, that's not high capex, but it's high spend initially to buy the spectrum and then high capex to build it out. Um, they can do the tricks like LTE broadcast. Now, that's not very high capex. That's, that's, a, that's, that's a very good strategy for some, so for some services, and we think we'll see a lot of that. But we think it's going to have a minimal effect, so it won't be at the top of everyone's list, except one or two, and we'll mention that in a minute. Install their own Wi-Fi inside um, you know, using services uh, and like and NSF and um, uh, Hotspot 2.0 and keep everything managed by the cellular operator is still high capex. You know, one calculation I saw said that if you do it that way, you're only saving seven or eight percent over doing it with um, with 3GPP technologies. The other way is to acquire Wi-Fi operators. If you don't have a lot of Wi-Fi in your own telco footprint if you're, if you're someone like AT&T, you, you do. But if you're not in that situation, then acquire operators that do have it, as Vodafone has done with Carl Deutschland in Germany. Um, it's got no CapEx effect, but it's got a huge effect on your capability to deliver Wi-Fi offload, but it has a lots of potentially ne negative valuation effects on your business. And the other op opportunity is to trade for Wi-Fi capacity. Um, buy in Wi-Fi capacity in uh, all sorts of different types of possible deals, whether it's from aggregators like Fong, like, um, uh, or, or even from the MSOs, um, or from um, hotspot aggregators like Boingo. Um, and it doesn't use a lot of capex. It just slightly marginally increases your opex, and you can balance it out. And I think that logic just means that this is virtually the only strategy that looks good. I said I'd come back to LTE broadcast. Um, we, we hear of it being talked about as a cure for YouTube. Um, a very simple thing is to broadcast the top 20 items on YouTube to phones which have storage in them and you would barely notice it and when you uh, get sent a link to one of those uh, items you will uh, when you when you press the link, you'll go to your memory on your phone and you won't touch the internet. Um, we heard that um, when Gangnam Style hit the market, it caused mayhem in cellular networks, and this would solve that kind of problem. Um, it would make light work of it. The problem with MBMS in the past was you needed a new chip. Um, the reason it's become in flavor again is because Qualcomm led by putting support for MBMS into its Snapdragon chips. Others have followed that already. It's not 100% yet, but other modem makers have followed. And um, we can see that there's a lot of use cases. What we don't believe is that, that um, the whole cellular community is suddenly going to decide that live television is going to be one, a major use case. It's a use case. Yes, you can deliver it. Um, and we, we know that uh, Verizon, that's listed 100 use cases internally, is, um, has rights to the NFL in America. Um, so will broadcasting be just like another media flow? Um, we know that cellular community did not like the idea of broadcasting. 
Um, mostly they didn't try it. Um, they didn't try very hard with MediaFlow. It was seven or eight uh, clicks down in a website before you could even find the video services. And they were priced quite high and the content was poor. So we don't think it's going to be like that. But we also don't think that everyone has sports rights. Um, and we, we see a lot of noise being spent on arena versions of, um, of LTE broadcast and potentially that only works if you have sports rights and in, in any territory that has four or five cellular operators you're going to find only one or two can afford the sports rights. Um, beware of, of the dogma. Um, there is a dogma within cellular operators that they must, in order to control the quality of experience, they must control every part of the network. And so using Wi-Fi offload where the Wi-Fi belongs to someone else, they feel like they want to put a beacon up and say, we're not responsible for this network. If you get poor performance, it's not our fault. Or they want to be responsible for it. Um, they're going to have to move away from that thinking because in order to use Wi-Fi offload successfully, you're going to have to test uh, networks and sense them and do calculations on them that aren't already built in that show that the quality of experience will be good and constantly monitor that and move around from network to network in order to use Wi-Fi offload successfully. So I just want to talk uh, for a few moments about the HomeSpot uh, and then I'm going to start wi wi winding up. Um, HomeSpot is a software upgrade to an existing home gateway to offer commercial Wi-Fi. Um, this was put to test in France by Free who decided that they would um, do this to 5 million uh, home spots and they managed to offload 70% or more of their um, mobile data traffic to Wi-Fi um, and they could use that uh, as they were a new license, a new, they had a new 3G license, they could use that to plummet the price of um, cellular in France. In order to survive, uh, SFR, the second ranked uh, operator there, had to um, copy the move and come out with the same kind of pricing. It was hugely disruptive. Um, we know that Liberty Global and Ziggo have built out two million in the Netherlands. They have not said what use they will put them to as far as as, um, as cellular offload is concerned, but they uh, talk purely about signing up customers who can use uh, broadband on the go. Uh, same thing has happened uh, combination of VU and Telenet, all MSOs um, attacking Belgicom in Belgium. Um, these are really dense networks. In this type of territory, um, the, we're talking about 48 access points per square kilometer. And with that type of density, you can walk from one end of the country to another and never be out of, of, of sight of, uh, of a Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, so why do they need cellular at all? Well, you couldn't do that in the US, but Comcast and the other MSOs in America have, over the last two years, installed 300,000 new hotspots, and they're about to turn 50 or 60 million homes into hotspots. And the combination of that will create a kind of compelling um, power of uh, Wi-Fi offload, even in a country the size of America. Um, Home spots we think of as unintentionally placed hotspots. They're less efficient. Um, there's a lot of technical issues associated with the return path, but if you can get access to them, they have oceans of capacity. Uh, we think that when you combine uh, that with um, um, with um, combine ho home spots with uh, further investment in Wi-Fi and some more hotspots of your own and some more aggregated hotspots, that there can be a, a really compelling argument for going down this route for cellular operators. Um, I seem to have lost control of the uh, internet. No, no. Uh, 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 it's actually time for our last poll here, so let's uh, uh, take a few seconds here to ask the last questions to our participants and I'm launching the poll so this is a poll regarding your views of Wi-Fi um, and so we'd like you to uh, um, 
take a few minutes to, uh, sorry, it's a few seconds to respond, uh, which of the statements you believe are true. Uh, there may be more than one statement that you believe is true, but uh, you can only choose one here, so I'm afraid. Um, so let's give it a few more seconds as uh, our participants are voting. Uh, by the way, Peter, we see your uh, we could see your screen fine. There's, there's no internet issues on our side. Okay, let's. So uh, let me close the poll now and share the results. So we have mixed bag here of responses. Uh, majority thinks that uh, the MNOs, which is mobile network operators, will partner with all types of Wi-Fi uh, providers. Uh, and uh, and they'll do what? That they will partner with all types of Wi-Fi providers. Thirty-nine percent. Thirty-three percent, which is the second most popular answer, uh, indicates that MNOs will prefer to use three GPP technologies rather than Wi-Fi. So perhaps we have a more conservative part of the crowd here today. And then seventeen percent that MNOs will partner with one another to build Wi-Fi networks. So there may be also a way for collaboration. Only a minority thinks that uh, MNOs will build their own Wi-Fi at 11%, and nobody, 0%, thinks that MNOs will do nothing about Wi-Fi at all. Uh, so Wi-Fi is definitely a, they need a strategy, whether it's a defensive one or, um, you know, or embracing it, but somehow they will need to do something about it. I think a lot of the vendor um, communication through the media has all been about the 3GPP technologies for some time, and it's only starting to become aware that, that, that the power that exists in both telcos who have um, their own uh, potential for home spots and, and MSOs, and people are now coming up with multiple ways of how to harness that in a sensible way that does not, not to the disadvantage of the cellular operator. Um, but uh, I think that's been quite new. That Don't to you. surprise me too much. Right, I've just got a couple more slides. Um, have I got control of my... Yes, uh, you can see your screen. screen. Yes. Uh, see my screen, but for some reason I can't... Oh, I see. There you go. Um, I just think to speak to that last point, that there is an irresistible desire by the management of cellular operators to slow down CapEx, and that the one way will be to do that by buying Wi-Fi capacity. Um, we think, well, what does that mean for the community at large? How, how will that disrupt? There is the possibility that if you're less profitable, that we get this kind of result where the cellular operator is um, less profitable because it's paying out in high, high amounts of money to um, uh, in OPEX for that type of service. And it's not unique because it, it, it's not providing uh, you know, if, if 70% of its traffic was traveling over somebody else's network. But um, I don't think this is true. I think that there will be a new revenue stream for anyone that's either uh, a telco or an MSO or has fixed line assets um, or has Wi-Fi assets. We think there's going to be a new lease in life. And we think there's going to be new classes of operators who, who launch into that with VC funding and try and innovate in that space. We think that by doing it, the Celco actually helps their valuation. Um, because they won't be overspending and feeling overcommitted on capex, so we think it, 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 it actually ends up with both of them going up rather than down. But I, I thought this picture was irresistible, so I put it in. And that speaks to the last slide, which is um, a series of the detailed projections we made um, based on all these six trends, um, which we really use just as an illustration of some of the things that might happen um, uh, over the next 10 years if all of these six trends are taken to their uh, natural conclusion. Um, and it's, these are not hard predictions uh, so much as illustrations, but they, we do see these type of numbers occurring. And while you're looking at that, I think that's probably me concluded, and I can hand back to Adelaine for any uh, summing up and questions. Thank you, Peter. Uh, yes. Let me see here. 
Yes. So I uh, we'll just would like to take a few minutes here to uh, you know, go over uh, the default line and, and who we are uh, also. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Marvelous Rethink, uh, we are a wireless infrastructure analyst here. Let me make sure here everybody can hear me. Yeah. Uh, we've been around since 2002. Um, the three top uh, areas of differentiation uh, include you know, our relationship with the carriers. Uh, and that's a very important element in feeding our research as well as the media activities we organize. We had the webinar with China Mobile uh, last week, uh, AT&T, the, uh, the month before that, etc. And so the the relationship with the carriers allow us also to feed into our research process, which I explained now. Uh, we have an expert analyst like Peter White, who is uh, focusing on the video aspects, but we will also cover the RAN, uh, Wi-Fi, specifically backhaul, and everything has to do with wireless infrastructure. And in terms of real-time value, it's really about providing the analyst support, having uh, them part of your team, and one phone call away. Uh, we would like to spend just some time on, on discussing the, the, the integrity of the data and everything we discuss that you know, comes from the interviews with the, the carriers, uh, whether those are phone interviews or online surveys, uh, and that's validated back with discussion with the rest of the ecosystem. Uh, specifically today on the fault line, so what is fault line for those who are not familiar with it? It's an annual service which includes 48 uh, weekly uh, issues, sorry, it's no research notes, it's a typo here. Those are weekly issues of the fault line, which is a 30-page PDF report that describes, you know, the important trends in the industry uh, around, you know, uh, the video industry, both in terms of the, you know, content trends as well as the, the platforms and the vendors and the ecosystem and disruptions uh, that are uh, being discussed today. And that's, of course, led by Peter White. So we have a special offer for you today, and that is if you subscribe to the annual service, which includes the 48 issues, you will get the uh, a free copy of the report that was uh, presented today. So the presentation today that was provided by Peter was, is, is a summary of kind of the um, highlights of, the, of that report. It was very successful in the market, which discusses the key trends uh, in the video marketplace, uh, especially the impact on, 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 on the cell calls and, and the telecom industry. So that offer is uh, available to you. And um, we have other services, which includes, of course, the RAN service, where we analyze the macro and the small cells and carrier Wi-Fi. And uh, those services are also available. And the, we have a specific service for backhaul. Uh, but I won't spend too much time describing the services. We rather, you know, uh, invite you to contact me uh, to take advantage of the offer today. Uh, on top of that fourth line service, uh, we also uh, have the opportunity to provide consulting services around video. Uh, Peter has been very busy lately with uh, helping customers uh, uh, drafting a, a strategy for the video offering, or you know. Um, advising them on, on, on the, the impact of disruptive forces and how to react to that. That's being participated also to some of the top conferences in the world. Uh, Peter, you want to say a word about uh, perhaps consulting services uh, around the video? Um, well, just that, you know, we, we, we take everything on uh, a kind of quotation basis, uh, sort of, of days required to, to do a particular job, everything from validating business plans or technology approaches to, to addressing boardrooms um, to help in decision-making processes or write, down to writing white papers. Okay, great. All right, so it's time for uh, the Q&A. Uh, we don't have a lot of questions. Seems like you've done a pretty good job in uh, you know, describing the, 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 the landscape out there. But we do have one that's uh, about how you can manage and offer QoS on Wi-Fi. Not sure that uh, that's your area of particular expertise, uh, Peter. Uh, if it's not, we'll follow up with, we have Klaus Heading, who's our Wi-Fi expert uh, internally too, uh, but you want to take a hand on, on that? And what, was, what was the question? Uh, how can you manage and offer QoS 
quality of service on Wi-Fi? It's funny, I hear that question at every conference. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> and 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 there's a multiple approaches to it. I mean, you get, uh, but, but fundamentally they are um, they're on board the the handset that with a with either a policy manager or an app, um, which effectively monitors the condition of the network and looks for alternatives uh, when they go below certain thresholds. Um, and that's more or less the uh, a universal approach. Yeah, and I'm sure we can follow up with more details about the, the, the different ways to deploy, you know, and again, the question is, and the response will be different whether you're talking indoor versus outdoor environment and um, the kind of provisioning you have to do for each type of environment and et cetera. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of complex provisioning. Yeah. There's different power levels indoor and outdoor. There's there's different reach uh, and and it's very different, you know, home spots with the millions of devices, of millions of access points are very different from a hotspot network which is planned to cover a, perhaps a weak, a weak spot in a cellular environment. Um, the, um, you, you, they, you know, I think network planning for Wi-Fi is not a massively a different process from network planning for small cells if you're doing that kind of hotspot deployment. But, if, you know, it's, it's, it's so what I'm talking about more is taking advantage of what's already there. Yeah. So look, we have another question here, uh, uh, and that is, won't content rights remain the stumbling block in deploying out-of-home TV everywhere? Um, Comcast has, has uh, very quietly negotiated out-of-home rights to almost all of its content. Um, yeah, it will, it will be a stumbling block. And a lot of the debate we're seeing, the argument between uh, CBS and Time Warner Cable, uh, all of that was, uh, all the rhetoric was about price. Uh, all the actual internal argument uh, we found out afterwards was about uh, online out-of-home rights. And um, where MSOs thought that they had the right to these exclusively and wanted to demand that you had to have a pay TV uh, subscription to own them. Uh, but in the end, uh, people like CBS are able to go and offer them to Netflix and Hulu and other people as well. Uh, so content owners are trying to claw back uh, out-of-home rights exclusivity, but um, definitely Time Warner Cable won the right to go out of home with the CBS content and uh, uh, Comcast are, are very quietly negotiating lots of rights to go out of home. And um, we, we see it being a fairly seamless activity, perhaps not in 2013, perhaps more in 2014. It, 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 a natural extension of what people are doing inside their homes. Okay, excellent. And that concludes our webinar today. I want to thank uh, Peter for his insights and, uh, and, uh, and uh, answering some of the questions. Um, I want to thank our participants for uh, attending this webinar. I want to remind the audience that we have a very important webinar at the end of the month with the, the Wireless Broadband Alliance, uh, where we will be providing uh, the results of uh, an extensive study we did on carrier Wi-Fi, and we'll be presenting this the state of the market. Uh, so November 26th, please tune to our web page and you, for all details of the registration. I look forward to engaging with uh, everyone that's interested in the special offer we have today, uh, the information provided here, and we'll be following up with the slides and re webinar recording. Thank you very much, everybody. Have a great day or evening.